Hi, good morning everyone. I hope that you and your families are well and happy. I'm really missing being at school and from speaking to some of you over the past few weeks, I know that you really are too. So in today's assembly, I'm going to be picking up on uh, some of the things that um, Mr Cassidy, Mrs Harris and Mrs. Ms Underwood were talking about um, in their assemblies and thinking about how to have and keep a positive self-image in this very, very strange time. Okay, so one thing that is definitely true at the time that we're currently living in is that social media and the media in general is playing an even bigger part in our lives than it already did. So using technology to keep in touch with people is great, but it does mean that you are on your phone and on social media even more than normal. I know that I definitely am. Um, between work and my family and friends, I'm replying to messages, looking at photos, watching videos all the time, and I'm watching a lot more films and TV than I would do normally. And I think that's true for everyone. You can't switch on the TV at the moment without someone mentioning the Tiger King. So all of this um, can have an impact on your self-esteem, and sometimes without you realising it. So in this assembly, I'm going to look at some ways that you might be affected and also at what you can do to combat that. So first of all, um, I'm going to talk, start by talking about um, keeping a positive body image. So when we're bombarded with um, images of people and told they're attractive, everybody starts to feel pressure to look a certain way. So these are called beauty ideals and they exist for both women and men. But what you might not realise is that these ideals change pretty regularly. So let's have a look um, together at some of the big changes for men and women over the last 100 years. Okay, so we are going to start our journey right back in 1910, uh, where the ideal woman was the Gibson girl. She was tall, she was ideally 5 foot 7 to 5 foot 9. She had very exaggerated curves created by a corset. Her hair was long, brown and curly and in an updo. And then if we skip forward 10 years to the 1920s, we see the front back. Now she was short, five foot to five foot three. Uh, she had a flat chest and boyish hips with very little curves. And her hair is cut short into a bob. Now, what's interesting to look at is that the flatter is the complete opposite of the Gibson girl. But women have stayed the same. They haven't suddenly all shrunk. It's just that the beauty ideals have shifted and what was once considered attractive now isn't. And that goes on through history. So if we look at the 30s and 40s, we can see that curves um, have started to come back. Um, we can also see that broad shoulders were very popular in the 1940s. And also apparently women grew taller again. Um, the ideal height ac across this sort of time period was 5 foot 7 to 5 foot 8. Uh, 10 years later, we see Marilyn, and women are supposed to be very curvy again. So the ideal woman has um, a 40 centimetre or 15 inch difference between her waist and her hips. So shops um, sold padded underwear to round you out if you weren't um, uh, wide enough in the hip. And she's short again. Uh, two, so she's uh, five foot one to five foot four, ideally. So we're going to move forward now. Um, we're in the sixties. Um, we get the ultra skinny, boyish twig look. So again, we go back to maybe like the nineteen twenties look. Um, flat chest, slim hips are back in fashion. The total opposite of what had been in fashion for the previous five or ten years with um, the very curvy Marilyn. So we're going to jump forward now from the 1960s to the 1980s, and there's another change. So now women are supposed to be Amazonians. They're supposed to be these huge warrior women. So the supermodels that everybody um, aspires to be like, um, like Naomi Campbell, Alan McPherson, are 5 foot 10 to 6 feet tall. They're athletic with um, really long legs. But then by the end of the 90s, we start to get um, the waist. So they are very small and petite. Um, they are supposed to be like a size zero. This is the phrase that was coined. Um, it's roughly a size four in UK sizing. Um, no muscles. You had to look really sort of delicate and petite. Um, but then if we jump forward to 2000, 
we do need muscles. We need to have like washboard abs like Britney Spears does here. And finally, we come to 2010. Um, everybody's short again, under five foot eight is ideal, and they want curly hips. We can see the lovely Beyonce here at the end. So I'm in my 40s, and I saw um, quite a lot of this evolution. So I was born in 1976, so I saw quite a lot of this evolution of beauty ideals. And there was no way that anyone could have kept up with the ideals that have been fashioned during just my lifetime. It is physically impossible to um, have a figure like Naomi Campbell and have a figure like one of the waifs like Kate Moss or the lady that you've got in the picture here. It's, it's just impossible. It's physically impossible to be able to do that. And this idea of beauty ideals and having like kind of the ideal figure is no different for men, even though it's talked about a little bit less than it has been for women. So a man in the 1910s, um, he wanted to carry some weight because it was a status symbol. It meant he had enough money to overeat and that he didn't have to do any manual labour. So the gentleman you can see here um, on the far side is a, a film star from the silent age of, of, of film around 1910. And you can see that in his uh, waistcoat, he's straining a little bit though, he's got a little bit of a tummy. And this was considered attractive at the time. We're gonna move forward then to um, the 1920s and the rise of Hollywood and Hollywood glamour. And what we see is that um, male figures have changed. So now you need to be slim and dashing and able to like ride on a horse and have an adventure and swing from a chandelier as the kind of the action heroes of their time did in the films. We move forward again to the 1930s and 40s and we see Charles Atlas. Um, he burst onto the scene with a bodybuilding program and as a kind of result of that being slimmer as a man was seen um, as being kind of less manly or had connotations of being less manly. This was in part because of um, the Great Depression um, and the um, Second World War. Men wanted to look physically strong um, and capable. You can see um, Atlas's, Charles Atlas's influence in Captain America's origin story that was written uh, the comic the original comic was written around this time so going from um sort of quite a small slight man to this kind of big superhero muscular superhero is in part inspired by by um charles atlas and his kind of workout program that he sold and promoted um in the 1950s and 60s it changed again so now that we've got the ideal man is the executive he wears sharp suits so he needs to have a slimmer frame he doesn't need really any muscle definition but he had to be tall so the ideal height was six foot so here we can see in the picture we can see um sean connery looking very dapper as james bond in the 1960s so moving on um into the 70s we've got mick jagger who was and still is um a pop star british pop star and the fashionable look for men of the time was shaped by the these pop stars so you needed to be tall, you needed to be thin, and you needed to be boyish. Definitely no muscles at all. But then in the 80s, we that all changes, and we have to be ultra muscly, like Arnie, who we can see here as Conan the Barbarian, or Sylvester Stallone. Um, but height wasn't a problem anymore. So um, 80s icon Sylvester Stallone is an average, UK average, five foot nine. By the 90s, um, there were fewer muscles. You didn't need to be as muscly as Arnie anymore. But um, what you needed to have was definition. And this trend in male bodies has continued now to a point where men seem to want to look like the anatomical models you see in the lab with every tiny little muscle picked out. Um, in 2010, we started to see the rise of what was nicknamed the dad bod. So this is a man who's relatively in shape, but doesn't have a six pack, he's a great cheese on, may even have um, a bit of a belly. And what's interesting, I think as well, is it's also proof that Hollywood stars um, do not look like they do in the movies all of the time. 
most of the time they just look completely normal and they work out and slim down um, for the period of time that they're making the film but the rest of the time they're just ordinary and I think that's worth remembering. So hopefully what you can see from this is that physical beauty ideals are impossible to maintain because they change all of the time. When you're measuring yourself against any so-called physical ideal, it's really important to remember that someone somewhere in an advertising agency or a marketing department will be the person who started that trend to try and sell you things. These ideals are made up and they have no real intrinsic value. If they did, they wouldn't change all the time and they wouldn't be the opposite of each other from one year to the next. And the same things are true for male and female facial beauty. These covers from Vogue show the changing fashions from 1983 to 2020. And something else to think about is that the beauty ideals we see in the UK are often focused on Western or more accurately Northern European beauty ideals. As we've been going through this assembly, it's not hard to see that in the UK and America, you don't more regularly start to see different ethnicities on the catwalks or um, in magazines until we're in the 21st century. And so that means for a long time there was a very narrow definition of what um, beauty was. And if we think globally, you realise what a small kind of percentage of people would be considered beautiful by these standards. Um, another thing to remember in these days of Photoshop and filters is that these ideals have become exaggerated to a point that is physically impossible to, to attain. So comparing yourself to a model in an advert is like comparing a home movie to the Avengers. So let's think about something as simple as a photograph. Before the photograph is even taken, there will have been a team of people deciding on every detail of what the final photo should look like. A professional photographer and his, and his or her team would be hired, a professional hair and makeup would be hired, a professional model would be hired, a set would be constructed and dressed, the model would arrive hours before the photo is due to be taken and spend that time in hair and makeup and being dressed, the photographer will spend time lighting the model, and then they'll take hundreds of photos from which just one will be um, selected. Post-production then take that photo and will alter it to remove any imperfections, remove certain features, um, adjust the lighting artificially if needed. So all of this happens and what we see is this. We see the final advert presented as if this is a real person who's just had a photo taken, but that is not the case. Even cameras in mobile phones can do this now. If we look at the photos here of me, um, if I adjust the settings on my phone, my wrinkles suddenly disappear. There's a filter on my phone that gets rid of my wrinkles for me. Even the really big ones on my forehead. Similarly, lifestyle photos on platforms like Instagram can have the same effect on our self-esteem. As well as comparing ourselves physically to other people, we've started to compare if our lives match up as well. And again, it's really important to remember that these are the heavily edited highlights of someone's life. I can make my life look lovely with a few well-chosen photos, so I can put up the photos from books and um, Tottenham Marshes, which is in my house in the sunshine, and say, lovely day reading, and a walk in Tottenham Marshes. But the reality is, is that at the moment, because I'm in the house all the time, what I'm mostly doing a lot of is cleaning, because even, you know, if there's only a couple of you in the house, when you're indoors all the time, you just it constantly gets messy. So when you're looking at people's lives on Instagram, what you need to remember is that is not their real life. It is the parts of their life that they've chosen to show you and that the reality of what their actual life is like is very, very different from the kind of highlighted edit that you see. So what can we do to challenge these ways of thinking? Well, the first thing we can do is we can stop making comparisons. When we compare ourselves repeatedly to other people, we can enter into like a whirlpool of shame. Each comparison we make will find something else that's apparently wrong with the way we are. And over time, um, we will spiral into ourselves and lose perspective on the reality of the situation. Very often, the things that we don't like about ourselves, someone else wishes they had. The grass is always greener on the other side. 
And if you find yourself making too many comparisons to other people, try and catch yourself and either start doing something else to distract you, leave the phone, leave the computer, leave whatever, and go and do something real. Do some exercise, talk to your family, uh, read a book, one of my favourites. But do something that is different and is real and is based in the real world. And that will help to, you to keep perspective, especially in a time like this when a lot of the lives that we are living are online. Another thing you can try is you can list three things that you really like about yourself and really like about who you are. Try and um, maybe avoid the physical and just think about, you know, what is it that is unique and special about you? What is it that your friends love about you? What is it that your parents love about you? The next thing we can try is we can change the script. So instead of saying, I wish I had her hair, try saying, her hair looks really nice. I wonder how she does it. I might try that. Instead of saying, my life's so boring, it's not like his, try that looks really interesting. Maybe I'll have a go at learning the guitar myself. Instead of saying, I wish I had those trainers, then I'd be happy. Try thinking or doing, saying, I'll call Sally. He always makes me laugh. That will make me happy. So changing what we say helps us to change how we think. So if we're constantly thinking negative thoughts, then that will spiral into a negative mindset and a negative way of thinking. Whereas if we um, say things in a positive way, even if it's just inside our heads, it will help us to keep perspective on the real world, perspective on how we see ourselves, and have a much more positive outlook about life. Next, we need to remember to keep some perspective. So as we've seen, all eras, cultures, races, communities have ideas about what constitutes beauty or success or being cool. But the thing that all of them have in common is that that is someone else deciding for you what you should be and how you should look. And really, that is up to you. So trying to attain all of these ideals is impossible. It's much more productive to focus on who you are and what you do and how you contribute to the world around you. And it's important to remember that no one ever built a statue to someone for having great hair or having a six pack or having a nice car or having new trainers. That never happens, and it never will. The important thing is who you are and what you do, and and how you make the world better. Uh, a final thing is to find positive role models. So artists like Lizzo recognise that the pressure that people face to look and live a certain way, and they try to address that in their work. So Lizzo is an advocate for body positivity self-love and making and she makes diversity like of all kinds the focus of her music her group of backup dancers are the big girls and they it consists of dancers with a range of figures and body types and she does this to highlight body inclusivity and to celebrate individuality so to wrap up the most important thing is that you like yourself and you're kind to yourself and kind to the people around you. It is fine to aspire to be like someone else, but it, you should be aspiring to be like someone for what they've achieved and what they've um, contributed to the world. <clears throat> Not something superficial like what they look like or what they own. No one will look back in 20 years and say, remember Katie, she had such toned arms. But they might say, remember Katie, she always cheers me up. So take care of yourselves, take care of the people around you, and hopefully I will see you back at school very, very soon. Goodbye.